So yesterday we we talked about uh, uh, rotator cuff disease, a little bit of pathophysiology, and about partial tears of the rotator cuff, uh, or especially the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, now I'd like to continue that discussion about uh, uh, interstitial tears, which we talked a little bit about before. Here's just an example, and you'll see these uh, not infrequently, where you can see that the tear is basically longitudinal along the fibers of the tendon and the muscle. Very frequently, you'll see a cyst develop uh, approximately here in the muscle itself. And you may or may not see a communication distally with the interstitial tear and the joint space. And you may or may or may, or may not see it at arthroscopy. Uh, but mo probably all of these have some sort of a, a, uh, a communication with the, either the joint space or the bursal space. So that's a longitudinal tear. You can see it nicely on the, on the sagittal images and follow the, the uh, plane back. Here's, a, a, here's an interstitial tear again where we can see a proximal cyst develop within the muscle itself, a lot of distal tendinosis. And this one, it was hard on the, on the fluid-sensitive images to actually follow the tear all the way into the joint space. <clears throat> and here's the cyst, which we can see here adjacent to the supraspinatus uh, muscle. And then here's another partial tear. Here we can see the partial tear going into the cyst of, uh, into the joint space on the inferior aspect of the uh, supraspinatus tendon, and a nice little part, uh, heart-shaped uh, cyst here in the mm -hmm. tendon itself. Yeah. And we can see it here on the sagittal images. Is there any differential when you see that kind of? Is there any differential when you see that kind of fluid in the muscle, or is that pretty much where you should be looking for a tear, and that's pretty much that? In, in this location, it's almost it's virtually always associated with a tear. You always have to think about a uh, myxoid sarcoma whenever you see a cyst within the muscle. In this location, it's such a common location for a tear, uh, and myxoid sarcomas are so rare in, in muscles that it uh, would it would be a good reportable case if you saw a myxoid sarcoma. So, uh, so I really wouldn't worry too much about it. And here's just a, here's one with low signal intensity, uh, due to an acute hemorrhage within the cyst of the of the tear of the, of the muscle and tendon, and this is just another longitudinal tear, which you can follow. This one is into the infraspinatus vein, and there's the. Uh, okay, and then here's a 37 year old male. Uh, it was for root, root, uh, rule out rotator cuff tear. Here we can see a tear extending to the inferior articular surface. And then if you followed it farther out, you can see that it really extends primarily into the infraspinatus back here. And this just points out, if we go back here, even though this looks like it's in the supraspinatus tendon, what you have to realize is that the posterior third of the fibers of the supraspinatus and the anterior half to a third of the fibers of the infraspinatus really co-mingle when they insert on the greater tuberosity. So those, those really overlap in that location. And we can see that this is actually a tear of the infraspinatus, even though it really looks like it's in the plane of the supraspinatus. And that's because of the overlap of those fibers where they insert. And that makes it a, continu a continuous sheet over the superior and posterior aspect of the, of the rotator cuff. You only get the break in the interval due to the rotator cuff interval because of the core core process. Assume this fellow was a weightlifter. Uh, I would assume he was, but I don't know. I assume he was a weightlifter, but I don't know. All right. So there we can tear, and it extends down into the infraspinatus, and there we can see on the oblique sagittal. And here we can we can actually see the tendinosis in the overlap fiber region. This is the area where we have only supraspinatus tendon. There's the overlap region where we have both infraspinatus and supraspinatus tendons. And then more posteriorly, you have the infraspinatus. And then down further is the teres minor insertions. Now, the other area where we can get partial tears are actually in the foot plate itself. And here we can see this uh, supraspinatus tendon coming down and attaching to the foot plate but we see a partial tear involving a significant amount of the foot plate. Uh, here we have contrast, so presumably you have actually a partial tear where the contrast is located and tendinosis 
uh, throughout the rest of the foot plate with just a little bit of more normal tissue attaching to the uh, superior uh, portion, which we can see there. On the T2-weighted image, it hollocks low in signal intensity. Again, like we said before, the T2-weighted images are very specific and very useful for complete tears, but they tend to be very insensitive to partial tears. So you really have to look at all the sequences that we recommend taking. Here's that same patient uh, a little bit later, and we can actually see a much better developed partial tear with rather sharp margins now, compatible with more of a chronic, uh, stable partial tear of the foot plate insertion. And again, we try to estimate the percentage involvement here, and this roughly involves about 50% of the thickness of the uh, insertion. This is a 27-year-old female who actually came in with a softball injury. What we can see here is a lot of tendinosis within, this case, the supraspinatus, and actually more posteriorly, the infraspinatus tendon. If we had it in the plane, we can see a partial tear of the foot plate insertion and a large uh, erosion here. Uh, and these, again, as we talked about before, are associated with trabecular bone injuries and partial tears of the uh, tendon insertion. And there's the erosion in the foot plate and the tendinosis. Here's a 15-year-old wrestler who developed shoulder pain, and here we can see high signal intensity, this time more on the bursal side, some tendinosis within the distal tendon, and also some marrow edema within the bone itself. And this is a partial foot plate avulsion uh, due to an acute injury. Okay. Another example of T1-weighted PD fat sat image where we see a lot of ill-defined uh, increased signal intensity within the supraspinatus tendon. Here's the T2-weighted image where we can really see that the tendon is, a is pulled back here. There's probably a little scar in sight too and a full thickness tear of the uh, supraspinatus. This was another one that was normal at surgery uh, because they just looked in here at the uh, uh, in the joint side surface and the inferior surface is probably intact here but for mechanical purposes, this is really a complete tear. And th these peripheral tears like this may be difficult to see in arthroscopy. John, do you want to comment on that? Well, that's maybe a scarred um, bursal tissue and uh, with multi-granulation tissue uh, with it. And, uh, that's a scar. I don't know how to describe it other than that. So you would be able to see that, though. They didn't at this one. This one was arthroscope, and they, and, they, and they didn't see it. They knew it was there at arthroscopy, but they couldn't see it. And, and I just want to point this, this out. And, and the problem is that it probably does scar down here, and therefore when you get in there, the synovium is covering an area of scar, which is kind of temporarily healed, but, it, but it's not normal. Uh, they did not go into the bursal side on this to look at the bursal side. Uh, but but it just points out that there can be discrepancies between surgery and MR, and the substance of the tissues we can really see much better with MR than at surgery. So MR can be very helpful to the surgeon, and it's important for the radiologist and the surgeon uh, to talk about and communicate with these these kind of issues. I was called to look at this case because I was called by the surgeon saying that the, the radiologist had overcalled uh, a lesion that they didn't see. Uh, and I think we can see that there's a lot of proximal retraction of the muscular tendon junction. So I think this was a, a tear. It's just maybe difficult to see because of the scarring uh, at arthroscopy. And you just need to be aware of that so you can discuss that with the surgeons that you're going to be dealing with in your practice. So would the radiologist... Did they point out that this is probably a bursal surface tear, or is that what was lacking? Maybe they didn't discuss his bursal, so that surgeon didn't go looking in the bursal side, or? Well, no, th this was just called a full thickness rotator cuff tear, and the, and the measurements were given. And I would say 90% of the time, this will be easily seen at arthroscopy, especially if it's more acute. This was probably more chronic. It probably been there for a while, allowing it to scar down, in which case the synovium covered the scar, and you couldn't see it without actually probing in through the synovium, which in the peripheral location like this, they, they probably didn't do.
if you look at the book I left over there in arthroscopy of the shoulder, you, you'll see some limitations that you have in terms of moving the shoulder around and, and portals where you can uh, see the, the pathology and you may not be able to see it all the time. I've, I've seen knees and shoulders that had o over 30 punctures. They kept trying to find something and they couldn't and, and it, it's almost hilarious uh, pathetically hilarious when you see some of these things uh, in a conference. So again, just to realize this, <clears throat> some of the both false negatives and false positives that both surgery and and uh, NMR have. <clears throat> now let's move on to full thickness tears. And <clears throat> there are a number of findings we look for for full, for full thickness tears. We look for fluid going into the subacromial bursa. We look for subcoracoid fluid, which I'll point out in a minute. Uh, we look for actually fru fluid interrupting the tendon itself, where the tendon pulls back and fluid fills the, the torn, empty space. We look for proximal retraction of the muscular tendinous junction that we've talked about repeatedly. Uh, we look for scar in situ, which again, we've also talked about repeatedly. In longer, more chronic stages, especially the massive tears, you can get muscle atrophy and then fibrosis within the muscle, which may make it very difficult or impossible to free up the muscle, pull the tendon back over and repair it normally without having to put some sort of graft tissue in uh, at the time of surgery. And then in long-standing disease, we look for evidence of rotator cuff arthropathy or degenerative disease of the shoulder due to the long presence of a long-standing large rotator cuff tear. So here's a 45-year-old male who has shoulder pain. Uh, what do you see in this case, Sheila? So I see a um, significant amount of fluid in the subdeltoid bursa, sending into the subacromial bursa, um, and it looks complex that there's, um, I guess it could be synovial thickening within the bursa, so a bursitis, significant bursitis. Um, additionally, the supraspinatus tendon, the, it doesn't look normal at the insertion, so it looks like there's probably a rotator cuff tear maybe with scarring. Uh, I mean, it looks like maybe even scarring, maybe there's just minimal scar at the insertion site. Um, so, so we're seeing a lot of the things we've talked about. We can see that there's some osteophyte on the inferior surface of the acromion, which is remodeled and ebernated. We can see that there's a full thickness rotator cuff tear with proximal retraction of the muscular tendinous junction, as well as the tear itself. And then we have all of this fluid and synovial thickening in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, with probably a little bit of acute hemorrhage in here with the low signal intensity, and an erosion of the greater tuberosity uh, where the tendon has been torn off uh, the supraspinatus insertion. So a lot of the findings, tip, uh, uh, this would be rather significant subacromial fluid and a rotator cuff tear. Here's a little smaller tear we can see on the sagittal images, a little small full thickness tear at the anterior insertion of the supraspinatus tendon on the greater tuberosity in that location. And in this particular case, we don't see a lot of fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, but what we do see is fluid anterior to the, subcor to the uh, subscapularis muscle. This is the coracoid process. This bursa in here is called the subcoracoid bursa. It's separate from the uh, subscapularis bursa, which is right here, which is part of the joint space. We can see the, uh, the capsule separation in that location. The reason this is important is that the subcoracoid bursa most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time has a free communication with the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And when you're upright, this is the dependent location. So if you have a small amount of fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, it tends to pocket down here. So this may be a more sensitive place to detect subacromial subdeltoid fluid than up here in the subacromial bursa itself. And this, when you see this, the most common cause is a rotator cuff tear, which is what we see here. So it's a finding that you can see that's a secondary finding to help corroborate the diagnosis. Now, here's a patient, sagittal T2-weighted images. Here we can see the sub, uh, uh, subscapularis uh, muscle in this location. This would be part of the subcoracoid bursa here that we were just talking about. This is the actual capsule of the shoulder, and this is considered the subscapularis bursa, which is actually 
uh, a part of the glenohumeral joint space. So we can see that they can be separated and the, the sub scapular bursa uh, should not go I I anteriorly here. This, this is the subcoracoid bursa and this would be the joint space uh, right there. So if you see fluid going anteriorly along the margin of the subscapularis muscle, uh, that is abnormal and not just joint, uh, joint space. And there's the capsular separation. And here's, just, here's an example where we can see a, a rotator cuff tear. This is on the PD fat sat images, or it looks like a rotator cuff tear. On the T2 weighted images, it's a little in, increased signal intensity, but it doesn't look like a full thickness tear. <clears throat> but if we go a little bit more peripherally, we can see that uh, a tear at the anterior insertion. And then if you follow the fluid signal, it goes down into the subcoracoid uh, sub burst, so you can follow it all the way down. Uh, you can also get abnormalities. You can get fluid in the subcoracoid bursa if you do an arthrogram and you inject in the bursa, not in the glenohumeral joint space, which occurred in this particular case, in which case the fluid can go in the opposite direction under pressure, and you can inject in the subcoracoid bursa and fill the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So that's another thing that we hope you don't see very often. And then postoperative, as we said before, very often after surgery, uh, the spaces that normally don't communicate will communicate. And here we can see a subcoracoid fluid after surgery uh, due to postoperative leaking. And here we can see a tear of the supraspinatus tendon and the foot plate insertion, the typical location of the tear. Here's in the sagittal plane. We can see the fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, pretty classic appearance. Here's another full thickness tear little downsloping with a lot of ebernation and inferior osteophyte from the, uh, from the acromion, and then the full thickness tear with a little retraction of the muscle. And here it is in the sagittal plane. So uh, again, as I've talked about, I like to measure these on the T2 non-fat suppressed images, the anterior posterior diameter in the sagittal plane, as well as the lateral diameter and the oblique coronal plane to get the size of the, of the tendon. And then state exactly where it's located. Again, the vast majority of these are going to be at the anterior insertion on the foot plate. That's where they start. Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so looking here, I'm, I don't see I don't see the supraspinatus. I don't know if we're at a different cut. I don't see the supraspinatus tendon at all. Or two arterial, okay. Okay, so that may be the supraspinatus going across. All right. Okay, so maybe the cut, or it could be some tendinosis there. And then superiorly above that, there's a, it's probably a, a body, low intensity rounded structure, in the subacromial bursa. Here's the axial injection. Okay, so the axial. Cut through that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it looks like probably a, a, a body that's within the subacromial bursa. Well, guys, I think what we're seeing here, if you look on the axial images, what you have here is a tear of the anterior portion of the subscapularis tendon, and then it's displaced anteriorly. So I think what you're we're seeing here, this isn't a loose body. The, you're, here you're cutting across the frayed ends of the supraspinatus tendon, which torn, and it's been displaced. See how it's displaced here? So it's torn out here and it's just displaced over here. There's the full thickness defect of the tendon, and it's retracted and displaced there, so that wasn't a loose body. That was actually a tear of the uh, torn end of the tendon. Uh, so you can get displacement like that. You just have to be careful because you wouldn't want to call that a loose body and have them spend a lot of time in surgery trying to find a loose body when what it really is is just uh, cutting across the, the end of the tendon. And then here we can see a, a full thickness tear with uh, a communication of the uh, through the tear. But notice that we don't have free flow into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And again, that's because you can, in cr these chronic lesions, you can develop scar tissue. And even though you have fluid going through the defect in the tendon, 
it's still localized here due to scar tissue that's developed in the bursa. And there's just uh, more, more tear with a lot of scarring and uh, fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And then we already talked about scar in situ. Here's a case where the, the tendon, the supraspinatus is torn, markedly retracted, and this is our all scar in situ, which de has developed. Uh, so this is the distal end of the tendon. This is the length of the tendon tear, and this dark stuff in here isn't tendon. That's all scar in situ, which, as we talked about before, does not have the mechanical integrity of tendon. And if the patient has the indications when you go in, you need to debreed that and then repair back to the tendon, not, not the scar tissue. Just another example of scar in situ. We had pain, pain after surgery and developed this extensive scar in situ. And this involved both the supra and the infraspinatus tendons. Again, marked proximal retraction of the muscular tendonous junction of both the supra and infraspinatus uh, tendons with an extensive scar in situ. And this one actually involved the teres minor as well. Okay. Uh, things that you have to look for which are uncommon and supraspinatus tendon tears. Here we can see a tendon tear. Here we can see there's a direct ar articulation between the humeral head and the acromion. So there's severe migration, uh, complete loss of the articular cartilage, a lot of irregularity of the subchondral bone due to the abnormal trauma against the acromion process. You see a lot of marrow edema here, but also note, notice this is the retracted supraspinatus muscle and tendon, and as the tendon is actually going into the glenohumeral joint space here. So uh, abnormal position of the tendon. How long does it take for the humeral head to rise, like to become high riding? I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, it depends on how much splinting the patient has. You put these shoulders um, at rest, put them in a sling, and you'll get a separation of the humeral head and the chromial process. And many times, you, after trauma, you'll see patients in a sling, and you take an upright x-ray, and the head will be subluxed, or at least it looks subluxed, but it's not. It's just a relaxation of muscle. So you can't really go by uh, what you see in a patient that's at rest or when a patient is, is splinting uh, due to pain. That, that even looks painful, I mean, big time. And, uh, yeah. so, so I like to look for the bony reactive changes we see here, <coughs> of which this patient really has all of the bony reactive changes. And this is all compatible with rotator cuff arthropathy <coughs> because the abnormal articulation of the bones when the tendon goes there. Now, in the shoulder, there are many different structures which work together to create stability because it's intrinsically the most unstable joint in the body. If you just got rid of the, of the supraspinatus tendon alone, you wouldn't get superior migration. It also takes uh, laxity of multiple other stabilizing structures. And, and I think the time it takes to do that uh, varies a lot depending upon the activity of the individuals and how strong the other structures are that, that support the stability but probably years, I would guess. So what's the main structure that holds um, the humerus um, in, the, in the shoulder joint? Um, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the rotator cuff and the capsule and the glenohumeral ligaments within the capsule. How about uh, the scapula that holds it in place? Hmm. ligaments between the acromial process and, and, and the clavicle, and that, that's it. Otherwise, it's all muscle and uh, fascia, the trapezius muscle here. I mean, not the tra trapezius, but the, yeah, I do mean trapezius, and, uh, and the deltoid, and, and so on. All the muscle rhomboids. The, 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 the um, scapula is free-floating. When you have an AC separation, which we'll talk about, I mean, you know, then, then it really becomes free floating. It's all held up with muscles, nothing else.
here's a patient who we can see has a pacemaker. So the patient's not an MR scanner. We can see the injection uh, with the contrast going up into the subacromial sub subdeltoid bursa. And this is just a CT scan showing contrast going into areas where it shouldn't due to rotator cuff tear. Now, other injuries that you can get acutely that are associated with rotator cuff, really one is a traction of vol uh, injury to the greater tuberosity. Uh, this is uh, typically what it looks like. Uh, this patient actually had a skiing accident, went down on an outstretched arm, and had uh, uh, avulsion of the uh, avul uh, tension, marked tension of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, the tendon itself was strong enough where it didn't tear, which would occur in most older individuals. In this case, it was the bone that was the weaker link, and uh, it was the bone that fractured. So uh, we talked earlier about the things that have to be in the radiology report uh, when there's a concern of rotator cuff tears. We talked about size, quality of tissues, uh, tissues the location of the, of the uh, tear itself. Now let's talk about fatty infiltration because the more fatty infiltration there is of the muscles of the rotator cuff and the more retraction there is, the less likelihood that you'll be able to do a good repair because it'll, the, it will not be uh, uh, lax enough. It'll be too fibrotic and too stiff to be able to lengthen over the humeral head uh, to be able to do a repair. If you try to do the repair in that situation, uh, you can't tension it properly, and the uh, uh, surgical construct has a high likelihood of failure. So uh, w what can you look for? There are several things that have been described in the literature. You can look at the decreased volume of the supraspinatus tendon on the sagittal scans. Uh, you can look for the, the tangent sign, which I'll show in a minute, and you can look for the amount of fat within the tendon. The tangent sign, you take the oblique sagittal image uh, through the scapula. Uh, here's the oblique sagittal image. You look for the Y of the scapula here, where this is the body of the scapula. This is the chromium process coming off here. The supraspinatus is above it in this location. Uh, and you, you draw a line uh, uh, connecting the top of the chromium process with the top of the anterior scapula, and the supraspinatus should stick above this line if it's a tangent sign. If it doesn't, like we're seeing here, then that's a positive sign, and it's thought to represent uh, atrophy of the supraspinatus muscle, and therefore a poor uh, uh, prognosis for surgery. I, I really think that now after showing this, the important thing that you need to do is forget this sign, because the biggest problem is if you have, and I've seen it in, in this guy you notice is a, has a big muscles here, you can see this in weightlifters who have a full thickness, complete rupture of the supraspinatus tendon. The supraspinatus muscle is a cone-shaped muscle. It's very fat medially. It comes down to a point where the tendon takes off, and then the, t the tendon then goes up over the humeral head. If you have an acute rupture, what happens is the supraspinatus retracts, and the tip of that cone moves medially, and therefore you can have a, what looks like a very small supraspinatus muscle uh, and a positive tangent sign in someone who has no atrophy but just had an acute rupture with retraction of the muscle. So because of that, I don't think the tangent sign is very helpful. Uh, here's a 77-year-old female with acute injury and shoulder pain, and here we can see that uh, this is a positive tangent sign. If you draw the line across the top here, uh, the supraspinatus muscle is completely inferior to it. Here we can see is the, the tear of the supraspinatus tendon, the proximal retraction. But if you look here, the muscle itself has very little fat within it. And uh, uh, this actually patient went on to have a repair and had a successful repair of the supraspinatus tendon. So I don't like the, the tangent sign because in massive tears, it, you can get a false positive with the tangent sign. So what most people use now comes from uh, Europe, uh, Mulatto et al., uh, where they look at the amount of fatty atrophy within the, within the supraspinatus tendon. And if you see no fat within it, that's stage zero. A little bit of fatty streaks, that's stage one, which can also be just seen in people who aren't very physically active. 
Stage two, you see more muscle than fat, but almost equal amounts. Stage three, you get equal muscles of, equal amounts of muscle and fat. And stage four, you have more fat than muscle. Stage three and four have been shown to have a poor or poor prognostic sign for being able to have a successful uh, repair procedure. So zero through two is a green light. Uh, three and four is a red light. So here's an example. This would be more of a stage two. There are more than just a few streaky areas of fat, but there's still more muscle than fat. We can see a complete tear with proximal retraction. And here we can see it actually has a positive uh, uh, tangent sign. Uh, but this would be stage two. And if everything else were equal, uh, the patient still might be considered as a surgical candidate. Uh, here would be stage three, where you've got about half of the, the muscle is, uh, is fat. Here we can see the patient's already had a repair procedure. Uh, the construct broke down, and we've got a full thickness tear, complete tear with marked proximal retraction. Uh, this one I would be skeptical as to whether you could get a successful repair with this. So th this would be uh, stage three uh, fatty atrophy. And here's stage four. We have almost complete replacement of the supraspinatus uh, muscle with fat. Notice again we've got a tear, proximal retraction, and here we also have uh, superior migration of the humeral head, uh, a lot of uh, ebernation and marginal osteophytes, complete denudation of the articular cartilage with ebernation and subchondrocysts. Uh, so this is really more of an in-stage shoulder. Yeah, well. um, I'd say medically manage it or possibly a shoulder joint replacement. Replacement won't do it unless it's a reverse shoulder replacement. Uh, I don't think it would benefit from a rotator cuff. No, 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 no. That, that's obviously not going to happen. But a reverse shoulder replacement, where the, the glenoid is a ball and then a, and the humerus becomes a socket, uh, that will alleviate pain in uh, many cases. So that's the popular procedure now. It's becoming more and more popular. Uh, to get rid of the pain, and also um, not long ago, I think it was an article from Greece. Um, I don't think it was U.S. of A. Uh, recession of the deltoid muscle, uh, proximally, like a sonometer, from its attachment, so that it would take the pressure off the deltoid, bringing the humerus and and. Uh, abutting against the chromial process. Uh, that, that's an interesting thought about how to, it's a simple procedure, and if it alleviates pain, which these people claim, they did 30 cases, uh, that's something to really think about before doing uh, shoulder replacements, which are questionable. Could you do the replacement after doing the deltoid yeah. resection? Good. Yes. Good. Okay, so here's just... <clears throat> Here's stage four fatty atrophy of the infraspinatus uh, muscles in this particular patient. But uh, what I want to point out here is we can see that the uh, you've got ex extensive fatty atrophy here, but the tendon is intact. And in this particular case, the atrophy do was due to denervation from cervical spine disease. So just remember in your differential when you see focal atrophy of muscles, uh, think of, you have to think about the entire differential. Most of the time, if it's supraspinatus, it's going to be associated with a chronic long-standing supraspinatus tendon tear. But if you don't see a tendon tear, then think about the other possibilities. And cervical spine disease is a common one for when you see abnormalities of the shoulder. Now, the other thing to look for is elevation of the humeral head. We've already seen one where there's direct articulation between the humeral head and the acromion, which is clearly elevated. Here's just another example uh, where we can see elevation. In this particular case, the patient probably had an acromioplasty before, and if you take off too much of the acromion, you can get superior instability, which can lead to uh, uh, superior migration of the humeral head, which we're seeing here. Uh, when, when that occurs, you have very abnormal mechanics within the shoulder, which can be associated with chronic pain syndromes, as well as, you know, here we have a complete rotator cuff uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendon tears, which are retracted. So just be sure and comment on that. Uh, and here's another example. Again, the articulation with the uh, acromion, and we can see 
a stage four fatty atrophy of the supraspinatus and retraction. So just be sure and comment on that and the, uh, the hibernation of the articulation in your, in your report. Uh, now, here's another example of where there's a rotator cuff surgery repair with a, with a tear of the, uh, of the construct, and here's the distal tendon that's proximally retracted here. This is a, what's called a double row technique. Where you, we'll talk about this later in the surgery. This is just a nice example of where the suture anchors are. There's a proximal row here, uh, just proximal to the normal foot plate insertion. And then there's a distal row that's typically about a centimeter or less distal to the uh, peripheral portion of the foot plate. And then we'll explain why these uh, suture anchors are placed in these locations. And uh, we published a paper a couple of years ago. And, American Journal of uh, Sports Medicine showing that there was a better outcome using the double row technique if the if the rotator cuff tear was greater than a centimeter, but not ever not everybody's data has agreed with that. Uh, so that's a double row repair, and there we can see see that it failed. So then uh, the way. One of the treatments for rotator cuff disease, and it's not the only treatment, is, is to do a repair procedure of the, of the tendon. Uh, in the past, that was primarily an open procedure that had pretty good results. Uh, over the last 15 years, uh, arthroscopic procedures have become much more finely developed than they were in the early 1990s. And now the vast majority of tear repairs that I see on a, on a frequent basis or, or uh, arthroscopic repairs. For those repairs, typically what happens is you go in, you debreed the area uh, down to the mechanically uh, in, uh, strong tendon itself. You then pull the tendon over to where it normally should be placed. You put in suture anchors, you rough up the bone, and you pull the tendon and attach it to the bone. Now, the reason you do that, you have to remember is, the suture anchor attachment itself will always break down. The reason you do this is to place the tendon adjacent to the bone so that the bone can grow into the tendon and you can get biologic repair. If you don't get biologic repair, the suture anchor construct will always break down in the end. So you have to do this in a manner thinking of, of, of creating a biologic repair at the site. Uh, and here's just an example. Here's a pre-op where we can see a partial volume of the tear here with fluid going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. This patient, they went in and put in a single uh, suture anchor, and we can see that the tear has been obliterated uh, once the suture anchor was placed. And here's the tear on the sagittal images. That's where they put the suture anchor. They tied down the tendon and roughed up the bone in that location, and we can see that this was a good repair uh, at, the, at this particular stage. Now, oh, the rationale for the double row technique is the following. If you actually look at the surface area of contact between the tendon and the bone, if you do a single row technique, you find that maximally the contact area is about 40% of the normal pre-torn contact area. Uh, and therefore, you would expect that the best possible result you could get would only be about 40% as strong as the native tendon attachment, which they've already torn. So in an attempt to try to get the surface area attachment between the tendon and the bone close to the normal 100% amount, uh, there is the development of the double row technique, where you basically put a row of uh, suture anchors proximal, a row distally, and then the reason why there seems to be a lot of disagreement about the success of these, uh, how you actually tie the sutures in place may be very important because uh, <clears throat> with some techniques, you can, you can uh, wrinkle the tendon so that it doesn't uniformly have uniform pressure at the uh, foot plate attachment. So uh, a lot of the surgeons that we work with here try to do a suture technique to make sure that there's uniform pressure of the tendon, holding the tendon against the bone so that you can get the bone growing into the tendon over the entire foot plate area. Uh, 
All of the studies have shown that right after you do it, this technique in cadavers, the double row technique is much stronger than a single row technique, which is what you would expect because you've got, you've got twice as many anchors attaching it to the bone. The risk is if you put more suture anchors in, if the bone stock isn't very good, you can have more damage to the bone and you can get fractures and the, and the suture anchors can pull out. However, but if you remember before, it may not be so terribly important how strong the actual suture anchors are because in the long run, what matters is how much bone draws into the tendon to produce biologic healing. And the, and the cadaver studies have shown that if you do good, if you have a good result with the double row technique, you can get twice as much surface area healing to the bone than you do with a single row technique. So theoretically, it should be better not all clinical studies have actually confirmed that the theory is correct. Well, I think it, it, you do with what, what, uh, with what you've got. If you have room to put in one uh, anchor, you put in one anchor. If you have room for two, you put in two. A uh, single row, double row, triple row doesn't, doesn't make any difference as long as you uh, do a, a secure uh, repair. Make sure that it's raw bone, uh, with the raw uh, raw tendon, and uh, that's uh, that's what you want. Um, to be precise in terms of um, this or that or the other thing, it, I, I think that's just talking a lot. In, in surgery, you can't plan double roll, single roll, triple roll. Some some guys may be able to do that. I can't. I, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I'd like to see your triple row technique. <laughs> so I drew a row. Okay. Dr. Cruz. Cortical bone is a scansalous bone. You put in one anchor and then you don't have room for another one. You better not even try it. Yuri? Yeah, I have a good question. Is uh, using the, like a graft jacket, allograft, uh, I have seen some cases here with uh, grab jacket allograft. Is that the is that the same rationale, um, basically for you trying to get biological um, healing there, scarring? Are we going are we going to talk about that? Uh, um, yeah. Well, what you're talking about is a technique that Steve Snyder has developed and likes. Here, J John's going to further discuss it. Okay. Um, allografts. Uh, are used not to get function back so much as to alleviate pain. And it's almost like a spacer between the chromion and the humeral head. I'm not sure how well they work, but if they relieve pain, that's what you want. Uh, these people are not going to be in the Olympics. So, uh, so Yuri, I think you're talking about people with massive tears where you can't get really a native repair, and therefore you put in... Uh, additional uh, m material there to try to get uh, fibrous tissue covering the humeral head. And uh, I think Steve Snyder believes that that has, can uh, significantly alleviate pain and has good, good outcomes. Uh, my experience is that not a lot of surgeons use that technique. Okay. Okay, thanks. Spacer for pain relief. I don't think it's for much of a functional benefit. All right. But, uh, you know, Yuri, you might, if you see uh, Dr. Schneider, you might ask him about it and see what his rationale is and get back to us. Sure, sure. Thanks. Yep. And this. Yes. Yep. One of my ex students. Did you hear uh, John Yergudis, Yuri? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. Okay. And then here's just shows the, on, on the sagittal plane, the uh, pre and the post-operative appearance of the tear, and then the suture anchors in place in the area of the tear. And then just, just to remind you that if you have surgery, even if you have a good intact surgical construct, you can still get contrast extending into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And as long as the construct is intact, having fluid leak like this does not have a negative uh, prognostic value in the postoperative shoulder. We've talked about that reportedly. 
And then SCAR in situ, again, we've seen a number of examples of this, just showing you how irregular the scar tissue can be with scar in situ and the proximal retraction of the, mus of the tendon is way back here in this particular case. And then when you get re-tears, you really just need a, a, to see a frank tear in a surgical construct, which we're seeing in, in those locations. The, the re-tears typically occur in the same location as the original tear. Uh, so you know right where to look, and you can see that there's no tendon there. So this is a re-tear of the surgical construct. Here's, th this was a, or this was adjacent to the surgical construct. We can still see that part of the suture acre complex is intact, and the tear was adjacent to it. And then just another breakdown, a tear of a double row technique. And then here's shoulder pain, and we can see just a, uh, a little bit of a partial tear. And then this is just another complete tear. Okay, uh, here is a 40-year-old female post-op for cuff repair and biceps tenodesis. Three months, and the patient now has increasing pain. Michael, what do you think of this? Okay, so... We have so post-op rotator cuff repair. Okay, so it looks like the subscapularis tendon is intact. It looks like the uh, maybe some tendinosis of it. I see fluid um, posterior to the humerus there, and okay, so we got a high signal anteriorly. Hmm. Okay, so that's muscle. That's signal within the muscle and the deltoid. Okay. Yeah, uh, at some of the uh, uh, sports medicine meetings that I've been to, when they ask the question, what is the most frequently missed thing in a radiology MRI of the shoulder, they often will say uh, injury to the deltoid muscle. And it's easy to kind of overlook it and forget about it, but I'm just... Uh, you can see areas of focal atrophy of the deltoid muscle if you have chronic disease. Or you can see areas of acute denervation like this if you've damaged the nerve supply. Yeah, you can't. Uh, anything below two inches from the chromial process, you got a problem. Distal to it. Yeah, that's, that's only part of the muscle that's uh, atrophy, correct? It's only the anterior? Yes. So does that just mean one of the branches of the axillary nerve was? Right. Yes. That's right. Well, and, that's and, the most common one. Remember, the axillary nerve comes around the posterior aspect of the shoulder and goes around. And this is probably kind of acute denervation rather than atrophy at this stage. Uh, denervation uh, edema. Uh, okay. Uh, Susie, what do you think of this case? Let's see. Pain and weakness. Four, four prior surgeries. Oh, my heavens. Um, there's some well, I don't see any um, muscle denervation that we were talking about earlier. Semicromial fluid. Um, yeah, I don't really show you a PD fat side image on this one. Oh, suspected fluid. This is more um, P2 weighted images and T1 weighted images showing anatomy. Well, so, so where does the deltoid? That is that the deltoid is gone. I don't see any deltoid. I mean, I see the one that you have your arrow on, but like coming up over the humeral head, there's like no muscle. Right. And then here we can see that there's a big defect in the area, the focal defect in the deltoid muscle here. And this was a de dehiscence. Uh, uh, in prior times, and maybe now John can correct me, uh, one of the approaches to the shoulder was to take down the deltoid and that gave you access to the shoulder where you could go in and do an open procedure. But one of the common problems with that is getting the deltoid to heal back to the acromion uh, could, could, could be very prob problematic. And having a dehiscence of the deltoid uh, can really be a significant limit, limitation in terms of function. But maybe, John, you want to talk about that? Um, there have been other procedures where you would actually uh... – uh, cut across the chromial process uh, transversely in a sagittal plane, and um, 
can repair whatever you have to repair and then screw the acromion back in place. But as I mentioned a little earlier, um, it's a, a chromioclavicular joint that uh, holds up the scapula for the most part, other than muscles in fascia. And so any screws you put in there, which is cancelous bone, will not hold it. And then so acromionectomies and, uh, and such and transfers uh, cuts and, and all kinds of cuts have been tried in the chromial process. They, they've all been failures for the most part. You, you cannot touch that acromion except for the undersurface, but even that has gone into disrepute. So near uh, has gone into disrepute. So, so this is just to remind people to look at the deltoid uh, because focal atrophy in this case, uh, dehiscence and distal retraction of the deltoid muscle can be a significant factor and may have to be something that the, the surgeon has to address if it's present. Uh, Sorry, John. I, I, whenever I've done shoulder surgery, one, one thing I've always tried to avoid is is, uh, is freeing the deltoid from the acromial process or the clavicle. You, you just got to be, try your best not to touch that attachment and certainly not go any further than you're allowed, no more than two inches distally. And here's an 84-year-old female who has chronic uh, pain. This was to evaluate rotator cuff. And here again, we can see a dehiscence of the deltoid with distal retraction of the deltoid uh, and uh, focal absence of the deltoid in this patient as well. There's uh, other changes here uh, with cuff and deltoid tears. Uh, another problem, this is, a, this is a patient who had a suture anchor repair, you can see there, and had persistent pain. What we're seeing here is a cyst collection that developed around the suture anchor. There's a suture anchor placement. Uh, and here we can see these... Uh, uh, cysts, these can, when they get large enough, they can lead to the suture anchor actually dislodging and pulling out. And these are typically due to foreign body reactions. The suture anchors can, there's a number, a lot of different materials, especially now that many of them are bioabsorbable and they try to create a substance that produces a little bit of inflammatory reaction because they can then vary, they can, by changing the biochemistry of the suture anchor, you can vary the amount of time it takes for the body to resorb it and control that. But if there's too much foreign body reaction, you can actually get a cystic disease around the suture anchor, uh, which can uh, just call the anchor cyst, but that can uh, actually lead to uh, loss of purchase power of the suture anchor itself that can be pulled out. And here's a displaced suture anchor that's pulled out here, floating around in the joint space. So obviously, if you see anything like that, you've got to be uh, descriptive in your report as to what's happening. Here's another loose anchor that's sitting down here in the inferior joint space. Uh, Yuri, what do you think of this case? Okay, 63-year-old male with uh, shoulder pain after sur surgery. Um, yeah, so well, Yuri, that, uh, Yuri, while you're thinking about that, let me just point out sure. that, that here's the deltoid, and you can see how the deltoid is supposed to attach to the lateral acromion. And on those de deltoid dehiscences, we didn't see it attaching. I, I, uh, it's probably good to show right. when it's attached so you can uh, see the difference when it's not attached. Go ahead, Yuri. Okay. Um, there's a... There's a abnormal signal intensity uh, kind of underneath the uh, uh, supraspinatus um, at the level of the uh, glenohumeral joint. Um, In here? Uh, a little above it. Uh, right there, yeah. Um, it's a, I'm not sure if this is a, if this is a anchor or if yeah. this is a tendon. Good. Um, yeah, th this is an anchor that's been pulled out and retracted back by the tendon. Okay. Exactly. So that's obviously something that the surgeons want to, going to want to know about. 63-year-old male with surgery, pain after surgery. Here we can see some 
the uh, suture anchor pulled off there. Okay, why don't we stop here and we'll be, we'll we'll start here now. I'm going to be gone tomorrow and the next day. Friday uh, will probably be tough since I came back. And then next week, I'm going to be in San Francisco for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So why don't we have our next lecture next Thursday? Okay? All right? Question. What's the best way? Sometimes I can't tell if a patient's humeral head is high riding or if it's positional. Like, how can you tell if it's positional in nature when the head sometimes looks out of the joint? But I think it's actually positional. Like, it looks slightly. I don't know if it's, like, the way it's in the scanner, but sometimes, like, it looks like the head is, like, not uh, exactly. With a normal, well, uh, with a normal uh, rotator cuff, it won't ride high. It shouldn't at all. No, because it, 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 it sep there's a separation between the chromion and the humeral head, and that separation is the, the tendon and the bursa. The bursa, of course, isn't thick. It's just like tissue paper. But that's now if a person has a lot of pain and 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 then positions himself in such a manner that I suppose that can happen. But I'm not seeing that. Have you? There has to be some pathology to cause it to go right. Yeah. Uh, you'll have to show me some examples, and then we can talk about them. But but typically the humeral head should be well positioned within the the glenoid, uh, kind of centered within the the arc of curvature of the glenoid. Sometimes if people have really lax joints in the scanner, they can become a little bit lax, but they don't go up. If anything, they would come out and down a little bit just due to muscle relaxation. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it shouldn't go up unless you have significant rotator cuff pathology. And then as a bunch of those examples we saw there, if you look at the center of curvature of the glenoid and the radius of curvature of the humeral head, they were, they were, they were not congruent. And if the humeral head goes superior, uh, that's path pathologic. If it goes inferior and out a little bit, that could just be due to laxity and, and uh, relaxation of the of the muscles. And everybody in the swing can have a low riding humeral head. On the, and, and, and many times I've been surprised, and especially when, when I've had students uh, show them that uh, the, the X-rays and they they think it's dislocated. And it's hard to convince them that's normal, you know, just a swing doing. Okay, so we'll come back again uh, a week from Thursday. Okay. Dr. Cruz, cool question. Uh, um, so when you mentioned, uh, there are a couple examples where you mentioned uh, both tendinopathy and partial tear and uh, kind of uh, at the same time. I thought they were kind of uh, same thing, but just at the opposite end of the spectrum. It's a continuum. So with partial thickness tear being the worst on the continuum. So if you're already talking about a partial thickness tear, uh, I mean, doesn't it all start as tendon, tendinosis, tendinopathy anyway? Yeah, most of it starts as uh, tendinopathy with a uh, biomechanical breakdown of the mechanical integrity of the tendon. It can lead to severe tendinosis, which can then lead to partial tears, which can then lead to complete tears and then massive tears. Uh, that's typically the way it progresses. And obviously the, the nature of any intercurrent injury can either ex can accelerate that uh, progression of disease. If you, you could have a normal tendon, I guess, and if you're involved in a plane crash, you could have enough force to tear a normal tendon. So you could be outside of that range, but the vast majority of pathology that you're gonna see in the medical field is gonna be some degree of tendinopathy leading to breakdown of the mechanical integrity, which then leads to the, a tear of the tendon itself. So, so in, your, in your reports, do you talk about both of them? If you, if you do have both? Uh... Well, if I see a partial tear or a complete tear, as we talked about earlier, if you see a complete tear, you also want to comment on the integrity of the adjacent tissues. And we talked about seeing the differences between the signal intensity on the PD fat set and the T2 non-fat set mm -hmm. is the way we determine the integrity of those tissues, further request by, by Dr. Hawkins.
uh, uh, one of those seven criteria that he would like to see in the radiology report. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, and if there's a partial tear, I do the same thing. So I like to okay. get, let the surgeon have a handle on uh, whether the adjacent tendon looks pretty normal or whether the adjacent tendon looks like it's uh, severely tendinotic. Because that it. also, when they get in there, they may very much determine by uh, how aggressive they want to try to repair the, the okay. cuff at surgery. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So in terms of the purpose of doing a ro rotator cuff repair, particularly like a supraspinatus tendon repair, when you have a full thickness tear or even a massive tear, is it really symptomatic control you're trying to do? If the patient's not symptomatic, should we even be going in there and messing around with the tendon? Well, no, I think it's um, in, in older folks uh, where it's a chronic tear, um, chance of repair is slim, especially if there's fatty atrophy and, uh, and, and, um, and let's say it's not, let's say it's not a, it's not a chronic tear. Say, say me, I tear my supraspinatus. I mean, why? I'm not a well, throwing I'm athlete. Not what a traumatic tear, you would tear. For function. For function. And pain relief. But most people with tears are walking around, including myself. I, I have, I can play golf and I can't throw the ball, but I'm not left handed. So I can throw with my right hand. Yeah, I, I think generally in younger individuals, if there's a tear, you repair it, with the exceptions if you're a high level athlete in which case you don't repair it. So it gets a little bit confusing. And I think, you know, uh, there's well, becoming yeah. some disagreement as to what the indications for a rotator cuff repair are. And some yeah. surgeons are very aggressive and repair all rotator cuff tears. Some are much more conservative. And uh, I think there's still a lot of art to making that decision. And there's a difference between repetitive trauma and tendinopathy and partial tears versus a complete avulsion from a one single traumatic event. And you have to distinguish the two. If it's from one single event, you, you should repair it because you get function and pain relief. And you can't leave it for a month or two and think about it. You got to do it now, not, not later. Yeah. I think as a, as a general rule in orthopedics, the more acute the injury, the more likely they're going to get a good response from surgery. And the more chronic the disease process, uh, the less successful surgical repair is going to be. It's kind of a general rule with a lot of exceptions. Acute versus uh, far away subacute or chronic. It's entirely two different entities. Thanks, everybody.